Coming up on DTNS, is Roblox screwing over recording artists? Can the U.S. government help ease the supply chain strain? And is Microsoft entering a post-console existence? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 10th, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Drafalino. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. Before the show on Good Day Internet, we were talking about the perks you get when you get a new haircut, depending on where you live, <laughs> and all sorts of other things. If you want that wider conversation in our expanded show, Good Day Internet, also known as GDI, do so by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Starlink, SpaceX's satellite internet network, is reportedly in talks with several airlines to provide their in-flight Wi-Fi service. At a panel at the Connected Aviation Intelligence Summit on Wednesday, SpaceX's VP of Starlink and commercial sales, Jonathan Hoffler, stated, We've already done some demonstrations to date and looking to get that product finalized to be put on aircraft in the very near future. Motherboard sources shared forum posts made by hackers claiming to have stolen source code for Electronic Arts FIFA 20, FIFA 21, code for EA's matchmaking server, also source code and tools for the Frostbite engine, and various frameworks and SDKs totaling 780 gigabytes of data. EA has since confirmed to Motherboard it suffered a data breach and the hackers' claims are correct, but that no player data was accessed and EA doesn't think there's any risk to player privacy. Sony has revealed its AirPeak S1 drone specs geared towards professional videographers. For a mere $9,000, the AirPeak S1 works with Sony's A7S Mark III, FX3, and 8K-capable Alpha 1 mirrorless cameras that attach with a custom Gremsey T3 gimbal. The AirPeak has been has been between 20 or 12 to 22 minutes of flight time, depending on the load, stays stable in winds up to 44.7 miles per hour, and can go from 0 to 50 in 3.5 seconds. Sony expects shipping to start this fall. JBS, world's largest meat supplier, announced that it paid ransomware hacking group Revil about $11 million. The attack led to meat plants across the U.S. and Australia, shutting down for more than 24 hours. In a statement, JBS claims it was able to get its systems operational again without a decryptor from Revil, but it chose to pay to keep the files safe. Hmm. And following a New York Times report into the practice, Google is altering their search algorithm to lower rankings for sites specializing in posting negative information about people and charging them to remove it. The head of Google's search quality team, Pandu Nayak, said the company has been fighting slanderous content websites behind the scenes for a number of years, and their removal request forms get millions of visits a year. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Microsoft and how it may pull away from the pack when it comes to gaming hardware. Mm. Microsoft announced it's working with global TV manufacturers to expand its Xbox Game Pass subscription service to third-party smart TVs and is also building its own streaming devices for cloud gaming to reach gamers on any TV or monitor without the need for a console at all. Currently, subscribers can use the beta version of Xbox Cloud Gaming Service on Android and iOS, but that's limited. Xbox Game Pass has, up to now, let users download games locally to capable hardware, like a console or a PC, and that's in order to deal with video game file sizes and network requirements. Now, this could help differentiate Microsoft from hardware competitors. Sony and Nintendo come to mind. And with any luck, it might fare better than Google Stadia, at least Stadia so far. Game Pass's numbers as of April 2021 show 23 million subscribers, you know, and that's as it was before this announcement, so there's certainly potential and room to grow. This news comes ahead of Microsoft's Sunday showcase at E3, where it's expected to announce more information on Xbox Game Studios and Bethesda software titles, so this could tie into some interesting gaming announcements. The company also announced it's expanding cloud gaming to more countries later this year, including Australia, Brazil, Mexico, and Japan. You know, looking at this announcement, obviously big kind of almost uh, definitely coming for Stadia's launch, almost kind of getting in this Chromecast space with like this dedicated streaming hardware. I could see having some other extensions into that as well, depending on how they want to take it. But, you know, going back to Microsoft's original plans with Xbox, it seems like services have always kind of been baked into that. And like a console was just a way to do that. You know, going back to Xbox Live Gold, I'm kind of setting, the, you know, setting the tone for charging for uh, a multiplayer gameplay and that and other kind of services and stuff like that. 
even on through the Xbox One where y you see Microsoft having other ambitions beyond just being a game console. And the recent disclosure of, of that they've never actually made any money off Xbox console hardware. Now everyone assumes these are kind of lost leaders, especially for the first couple of years of console life. But I think Microsoft would be thrilled if they didn't have to make a console and they could serve, you know, they could provide these services uh, and make money the way they've always been making money, which is people paying for either titles or access, you know, to a subscription service. I think they would be thrilled if they didn't have to make yeah. a, a console sometime soon. You know, the, the industry seems to all be in agreement that at a certain point, when all of the connections get fast enough, and now obviously the cloud computing is certainly there, this will be the reality. It depends on when you jump on the boat and when you don't. If we are going to roundly assume that maybe Stadia was too early or Google was not the right player to make it happen, <clears throat> Xbox and Microsoft, which have big AAA titles that are exclusive to them, offering a different lower uh, price uh, a, a barrier, or at least a, a subscription price and not a one-time fee to buy oftentimes rare and hard to get hardware makes a little bit more sense. The question that I would say going forward is going to be exactly how aggressively they, pu they, 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 are, they, they push into this and we'll probably get a roadmap for that at E3. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who I do not own a, a gaming console, and it's always just been, do I care enough about any particular games where I would have to go Xbox or PlayStation or you know, you, you know, the Nintendo route? And it's always sort of like, I don't know. I, there's, it's, it's all very segmented, and that was for a reason, right? You know, Xbox got sold, Xboxes got sold because whoever was buying them is like, well, this is, you know, this is, this is the ecosystem that I want to be in. And this is the way that I play the game. Uh, so I think that even though game pass has 23 million subscribers, all of the, the potential subscribers, perhaps like me, or even people who are that much more interested in gaming than I am saying, Oh, great subscription service. Got it. This is yeah. Much lower barrier to entry. I don't have to buy a console. I don't have to, you know, you're still going to have to think about exclusives and who has what. But if it's working with a smart TV that I already have, or yeah, it's a low price streaming stick of some kind, then yeah, maybe, like you said, Rich, does other things. Uh, Nintendo, uh, not Nintendo, uh, Microsoft didn't really go into details on whether it's just one device or if it's going to be multiple. But yeah, it sounds like the company's like, okay, let's just forget this whole sell the console only, that's the only way that you can get this. Sure, enough people are still going to want to go that route. But for all the folks who don't, it it's just you're just going to sell them a lot more game passes. Yeah, I, I, let me just say on top of that, the idea of that streaming stick doing something else, I think is something that has sailed. We, we now see so many devices that do so many of these kinds of things, and all of them stream the same kind of apps that you would have previously seen on a device like this or in an Xbox and in the way they were trying to sell it as a media container. This is a way to get Halo into somebody's hands that wouldn't otherwise buy a console to play Halo. All right, well, the National Music Publishers Association, or NMPA, filed suit against the gaming company Roblox for illegally using songs from artists and is seeking a minimum of $200 million in damages. The NMPA is representing a handful of publisher plaintiffs in this case. NMPA president and CEO David Israelite claims that Roblox's user base of 42 million active players earns Roblox hundreds of millions of dollars by requiring users uh, to pay every time they upload music onto the platform, taking advantage of young people's lack of understanding about copyright. And then they take virtually no action to prevent repeat infringement or alert users to the risk they are taking. Israelite also said the NMPA will increase efforts to ID and remove all unlicensed music from Twitch. So they're uh, uh, kind of targeting two pillars of uh, the modern gaming community here. Twitch previously said in response to complaints that it acts on each valid DMCA uh, notification and removes the allegedly infringing content as soon as it's validated in compliance with DMCA requirements. In its response, Roblox says it will defend itself vigorously as we work to achieve a fair resolution with the music publishers. So uh, what are the options here? I guess uh, like Roblox changes its TOS so that liability shifted to creators. Are we going to see a uh, content ID kind of style system going on? Uh, you know, Justin, how do, how do you read the tea leaves of uh, the 3D chess here? There's only one way that this ends, and it's with the publishers getting a cut of the money that Roblox is charging. There's a reason why they're going after Roblox and not the users, even though they acknowledge in their 
a, a lawsuit that it's the users that are putting themselves in a perilous legal position. It's because Roblox has the money. If Roblox <laughs> wasn't charging to have them upload it, then maybe they would be able to, to take some other action. I mean, hell, that's what they are doing with Twitch. With Twitch, they're saying, look, we're going to DMCA the users. By the way, if you're streaming on Twitch, make sure to delete your VODs, especially if you play uh, copyrighted music on it, because those are the kinds of things that get DMCA'd for, for, for content stuff, and you could get strikes on your channel. Uh, resuming this particular talking point, <laughs> that's the only thing that they want. They want the cash from Roblox, because Roblox is extraordinarily popular, and they want a taste. They want to wet their beak. Yeah, I don't, uh, I can't imagine, especially because Roblox's user base skews so, so young, and there probably are a, a, a great number of users who just have no idea how copyright works in Roblox is not spelling it out, and they've been maybe cruising under the radar a little bit too long here. But yes, for for the company to say, well, read the terms of service, and if you do something illegal, then you know, you're probably going to get sued by you know some large music industry trade group. That's not going to fly either. It, it will become something where, yes, there is there is a sharing of the pot between Roblox and the NMPA uh, and what what that is. I mean, the only way that would really change much for the user is if the user needs to pay more in order to do that because Roblox wants to stay greedy and still take a cut and give music <laughs> industries a, a, that much more of the cut that they're getting. I don't really know. M maintain their profit margins, Sarah. I I think it's it's interesting to see Roblox's uh, clearly the money that they're bringing. I mean, they're bringing in billions of dollars in revenue. That that the NPM or the NMPA is saying, oh, the poor, uh, you know, the poor young user that just wants to use this music. They don't like. That's a very different tone than that we've heard in the past. Yeah, because the kids don't have the money. <laughs> Last year, Google's head of AI research, Jeff Dean, told ZDNet that he uh, he was experimenting with AI to design chips in order to cut costs and produce more efficient designs. In a research paper published in the scientific journal Nature, Google Research explained that they've developed algorithms to design computer chips more efficiently. Designing the physical layout of a chip, also known as floor planning, is a complex and time-intensive task. Researchers developed algorithms to treat floor planning like a game with components as pieces and canvas acting as the board. The winning results based on the performance used uh, evaluation metrics based on reference data sets of the uh, sorry the 10,000 chip placements. Researchers claim this method can generate manufactured chip floor plans in under six hours compared to months of intense uh, effort by human experts. The researchers also say that Google has already adopted the method and used it to produce the recent generation tensor processing unit. So <laughs> being able to say, hey, this could be less than one full workday versus months of intense work by humans, thats it's tough to argue against this being a great idea, at least for some kinds of chip uh, development and manufacturing. This is, this is cool. I mean, it, it's clearly Google's been working on this for some time. They have some examples of it working in, in the tensor processing unit, as you mentioned, Justin. And... You know, that argument of, well, I mean, that what are the experts going to do, right? If this is, you know, you just teach AI to treat this all like a game of chess, you know, it, it, you know what, how, what does this say about uh, human expertise? And I think it says a lot about what humans can have already built. They've built the system. This came from humans, right? So, yeah. you, know, what, you know, the humans now can, can hone this process and have so much more time to be experts. So the, the one thing is, the, at first blush, like this seems like something, oh, they can really speed up new product development with new chips. And yes, that that may be a component of this. But what I hope this provides the opportunity, you know, in terms of, you know, people being able to use their time in different ways. Sure, this it'd be great if this could speed up product development, but also, you know, we've seen now uh, for a number of years now, big architectural problems that we're experiencing uh, with, with chip architectures like x86 with Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, there's a couple other on the ARM side that are, you know, aren't quite as, as devastating, perhaps, stuff like that. We're seeing stuff with uh, uh, row hammer attacks where like the, the infrastructure of memory is at risk uh, because it's becoming more increasingly dense. I'm hoping that because, okay, we don't have to spend the human time designing this chip layout. We can just have a, a, a machine learning algorithm take care of that for us or take care of most of the work for us. We could spend more time looking for things like that that are way harder to fix once the chip is actually out there. Uh, what, one thing on this in terms of the AI component, 
uh, I think it's a great example of what AI is and is not. AI, effectively, a way to think of it is instead of an oracle at Delphi or some magic in the machine that's able to just think of things faster than, than humans can, think of it like a guessing machine. And if you're looking at something like designing a chip, that's a complex series of guesswork, but because it has the horsepower, it can do it. This is not a replacement for humans, but it is a tool that can lead humans in the direction that can perfect these kinds of floor plans that can make better things. Indeed. Well, if you'd like a DTNS hat, they're very nice. Hoodie, also nice. Mask, mouse pads, we have it all. We have all that and more, in fact, at our DTNS store. If you haven't looked at it in a while or you never have, do it now. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. Well, this is shaping up to be a pretty big week of news for tech out of the Biden administration. On Tuesday, the administration released its findings after conducting an interagency review on how to shore up U.S. supply chains. As a result of the report findings, the Department of Energy will create a 10-year plan to create a supply chain for EV lithium batteries that's uh, based in the U.S. with the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program, catchy name, set to distribute $17 billion for domestic R&D. The Department of the Interior, meanwhile, will lead a task force looking at U.S. sites for 17 rare earth metals, which mostly come uh, from China and certainly mostly from overseas. The report will also see greater supply chain transparency from the semiconductor industry and devote $100 million in grants to train government workers on these new initiatives, as well as prioritizing existing grants that provide for domestic production. In other news, Politico sources say House Democrats could introduce a series of five tech regulation bills as early as this week. One draft bill will let federal prosecutors sue to break up tech companies if they're found to have a conflict of interest. Another bill would require platforms to easily let users move data to other services, so data portability, mirroring a bipartisan 2019 Senate bill. A third bill would bar platforms from self-preferencing, targeting things like the uh, Apple's App Store and Amazon Marketplace. The final two draft bills would also require tech acquisitions to show clear and convincing evidence in court that a potential rival startup couldn't compete with it or pose a competitive threat and increase merger fees, which there is bipartisan. That, that increasing merger fees seems to be some bipartisan support there as well. These are draft bills right now. They're not even, you know, kind of circulating out there. So we will see what final form they take when they're out there. And then it's into the the political wilds. So, Justin, which is the bigger piece of news? And I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, what could help us out here to understand uh, where this is. Both of these are going. Before we even choose from these two, let me add two other things for you. Number one, passing the Senate this week was a bill that is meant to keep America competitive with Chinese interests, specifically in technology. That has a bit of a tricky road to pass in the House before it gets signed by the president, but something to keep your eye on. In terms of politics, the Biden administration, which uh, uh, Joe Biden is in Europe uh, for conferences over the next week, has said that during his meeting with Vladimir Putin, he is going to directly bring up the fact that he holds Russia specifically uh, uh, culpable for some of the, the ransomware attacks that have originated from Russia and basically accusing them of turning, their uh, turning a blind eye to it. Where we go from there, that is a big question. But if you are looking at all of this, the thing that matters the most right now is the first story that you talked about, the idea that this supply chain... Uh, which is a problem here. We, we found out during the pandemic that even if you are not a, a China hawk and you don't believe that uh, uh, China specifically poses a, a, a diametric conflict of interest with the United States of America, if you have an interruption of an overly distributed supply chain, then you have problems getting products here to America. We saw it with not only some of these uh, uh, rare earth metals and stuff like that, but also on a smaller scale with PPE and with drug manufacturing. Uh, when, when you have a lot of that stuff that happens overseas and all of a sudden those supply lines are cut down for reasons that are out of your control, you need to maybe rethink how much is produced here in American. Uh, uh, American borders. Yeah, big week. Uh, politics, politics, politics is uh, is uh, well. You're always busy, but you know, a, <laughs> a lot of news close to home. I stay, I stay busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Born busy. <laughs> 
Well, uh, also busy, uh, delivery drivers, ride hailing and delivery companies are always looking for ways to utilize their drivers most efficiently. The UK-based food delivery service Deliveroo has a new idea for their drivers, and that is reporting crimes. Now, you might say, that's crazy. How's that going to work? Well, the company is partnering with the Crime Prevention Network Neighborhood Watch to offer optional training, not mandatory, it's optional, to help drivers spot signs of street harassment, domestic abuse, human trafficking, drug smuggling, in many cases, you know, kind of big deals. All training will be verified by the Metropolitan Police and include safety and awareness training for drivers. This isn't Deliveroo's first foray into driver training, uh, partnering with the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children last year to train 7,000 drivers to spot signs of child abuse. Now, on the surface, you might say, well, yeah, I mean, we don't want bad people doing bad things. And if the delivery drivers are out and about and see something funny and have been trained, uh, you know, more than just sort of maybe that there's something funny going on so that they they have a little bit more of a leg up as to what what's right and what's wrong... That's a good thing, right? But there's so many potential problems with this. There I don't so, quite there know where to start. So, there are so many ways that this could go sideways. I mean, the one, again, uh, uh, harassment, uh, domestic abuse, all, all, human trafficking, all the things are hor- like horrible. We, we, don't, we don't want these things. Uh, but at the same time, like as a driver, if I get this optional training, is, is does the UK have some sort of I don't even know if it would qualify as a good Samaritan law where you're liable if you're if, if you accuse someone or or pass on a tip about human trafficking and that turns out to not pan out. I mean, at the very least, you've potentially severely disrupted someone else's right. life. They may come at you know, what what yeah. kind of what or kind even of, if it I does guess, pan out and you get like pulled into some legal thing where you're like a delivery driver and you're kind of busy and you know, it's or, or, let's, or these yeah, these are I mean getting into these could also tie into organized crime this could also tie into if you exist in a society where there are perhaps uh biases within your society this is it does nothing but it pass those directly before, on before right we even get to what they will do and whether or not it is a net good the question is why are they doing this and to me there's only two paths either a there is some kind of connection where they can get a a, a local or national grant from uh, some governmental organization that says, okay, we'll pay you money and or cover the cost of your drivers getting trained at some base level. So effectively, maybe think of it less like human CCTV cameras and more like everybody knows how to do CPR just in case, right? That there are in horrifying, very clear examples, you know how to identify that as opposed to just somebody walking down the street. Or they are trying to play a PR game and say, hey, look, we're not just a company that delivers you ramen. We're also a place where somebody might have their life saved. Now, if they did not lead with the fact that somebody had their life saved during an announcement like this, that means that that has not happened or at least (laughs) happened on some even anecdotal level. Good point. So I guess the bigger, one of the, the other questions is that does this imply that these del- uh, delivery dr- couriers are somehow obliged to do all this as part of their normal job of delivering food. One uh, would think, yeah, if you opt into the optional training, you're yeah, saying, but, I want to take this on. So no. if you don't catch something, are you then liable? That would, for- that, that would be that would be ridiculous. Yeah. If if if, if yeah. somebody somebody nobody's getting punished if they deliver a pizza to somebody and and they accident <laughs> and and they miss the fact that a guy is is doing is, is kidnapped is yeah. in the face or something like like that's that's not the, i think the idea uh, is they can identify these things and so if they do talk to police and they say oh well what did you see they know the signs that they can then say to I, the you know i the, yeah. i i goes back to what rich says there's a lot of ways this would go sideways and i'd probably I don't know if this is probably the most effective way for for any of, of this. It's to, not. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not, yeah. it's not the most effective at all. But also the question then becomes: Why are they trying to make yeah. these delivery drivers into? It's because yeah. it's foot. It's 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 feet on the ground. This is the thing. At least in the UK, the number of of metro uh, metropolitan force police officers is going to be cut due to budgetary constraints. So if you can somehow, what you were alluding to, uh, uh, Justin, somehow get some sort of grant and say, hey, we can have extra eyes yes. out there for you because you don't have enough officers because of budget cuts, then, hey, you could save a boatload of money and still have, quote unquote, the same kind of surveillance that you would require 
to to persecute you know to prosecute your job. Yes, and and just because everybody who knows CPR is not personally required to save somebody that is choking. Now they should, they might want to, they'll know how to do it if they do, but it's not like they're gonna get you're not gonna get arrested because it's like you knew CPR and that man was choking on a cannoli. Not not less that you get <laughs> not no no not that you get arrested, but you could I don't know in Britain if this would be a thing, but somehow get caught up in a lawsuit. But that's just me paranoid talking. <laughs> well, one thing that doesn't make me paranoid is something that Arcade One Up announced. They're adding The Simpsons to its retro home arcade cabinet lineup 30 years after Konami uh, first released the game. No official price yet, but word is around $600 when pre orders begin July 15th at arcade1up.com. Arcade One Up's parent company, Tastemakers, has already sold over 2 million machines with popular licensed titles like Street Fighter. X-Men, Atari, and Pac-Man. The Simpsons machine will have a few bells and whistles like a light-up marquee and Wi-Fi connectivity for online play, and I believe it also comes packed in with one other game if you get tired of beating up people with Martin Legendary, vacuum. Legendary yeah. side-scroller. This was, this along with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was the game that you played when it was your friend's birthday and, and, and <laughs> somebody's parent would just break off a $20 bill Four quarters into this thing, it's really fun <laughs> after the end. I always played Homer. What a game! Uh, I if I, I don't know, maybe I should get it. <laughs> you should get this. It could be it could be a kind of a cool thing I, for the I, PX3 I, I, studio. I, I don't know. I, I I think I would need more friends to come over and play because like it, it is always calling to you that you need four people playing at the same time. But Wi-Fi connectivity for online play, Justin. Modern world. Mm. Ooh, that is yeah. That true. Yeah. Scott Johnson, we, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, and I, I know he has um, one of the other uh, home arcade. I don't remember which one he said he had, but uh, but from arcade Joust, one up, and it was like Joust. Ah, uh, yes, 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 and said this is so great. I, I regret to say I have not played The Simpsons, it's, at least it's in a, my recent I mean, memory. The reason why you want all four controllers is you can you can you can knock your buddy who's right next to you. Like there, there is a certain level of there's a no there's a certain level of of social etiquette that goes out the window, and it becomes very friendly at first, but then it gets kind of visceral as you get towards the end, and you eat the one you get the one power up that you want. Yeah, I mean that that's that's a Mortal Kombat move. That's a that's a that's a Street Fighter move when you're playing against people. But but Simpsons is you're all you're all playing together. You're oh not not the way I used to play. We used to like we would steal the you would steal the power ups. All right, don't go over Roger's house. Yeah. Sure. You were definitely not not at my birthday party. <laughs> yeah, right. Gets crazy fast. All right, Rich, what's in the mailbag today? All right, well, uh, last time Allison Sheridan was on the show, we were talking about Amazon Sidewalk Network going live, but Allison didn't have an option in her settings to disable it. Uh, she did a little research and then wrote in. She said uh, she determined that her uh, Amazon-owned products are either too old are not quite the right models to be part of Sidewalk. For example, I have an Echo second generation, but Sidewalk requires a third generation. I have a Ring Spotlight Cam that is fairly new, but it's battery operated, and it's only the wired version that is part of Sidewalk, understandably. My Ring, uh, my Ring alarm system is also not part of Sidewalk. If you don't have any devices compatible with Sidewalk, Amazon doesn't want you worrying your pretty little head about it. That's so considerate of Amazon not to confuse me with my opt-outs. It's also, I mean, you think like, oh, that's all pretty obvious, but Amazon did not do a good job of explaining that because we yep. were all sort of like, I said, well, I see Sidewalk in my settings, and Allison said, yeah, I don't know, what's I, up? I did the same thing. I yeah. did the same thing. So, uh, but if you have thoughts about Sidewalk, arcades, or anything else, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Indeed. We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Dan Kolbeck, Jeffrey Zilks, and Michael Bolick. Also, very, 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 very special thanks to Daniel Dorado, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We appreciate all the years of support, Daniel, and thanks to all our patrons. Also, thanks to Justin and Robert Young for being with us today. Uh, Justin, what's, uh, what's new in the world of politics? Well, everybody listening to me in New York City, I will be coming to your windswept hamlet in a couple weeks for the big uh, New York City mayoral Democratic primary, which will effectively decide who the next mayor 
of New York City is going to be. It's a wild race, including a new controversy wherein the front runner may or may not live in New Jersey. Oh and my gosh, I saw media those pictures photos. about his fridge might be the smoking gun. <laughs> Uh, uh, you can listen to all of it and, and of course, follow all my coverage of my trip out to New York City to cover that at politicspoliticspolitics.com or px3podcast.com. Excellent. We're also live Monday through Friday on this here show, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Join us if you can and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom's back tomorrow and we'll be joined by Chris Ashley and Lynn Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>